Hello and welcome to the fifth lecture of Machine Learning for Robotics and Computer Vision. In this lecture we want to talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. But first let's have a look at what happened in the last lecture. In the last lecture we talked about ensemble models. And specifically we talked about bagging, uh, random forest boosting and in particular other boost and gradient tree boosting. All these models are uh, aimed at learning from some weak classifiers a stronger model by putting this together in an ensemble. From this we got a strong classifier. And as I hopefully convinced you last time, these models were powerful off-the-shelf models that you can use for your machine learning classification tasks. So um, these are the go-to methods basically when you want to have a good classifier in the end. But in this lecture we want to leave a little bit this uh, supervised uh, setting where we had for each data point also a label available and look at uh, what we can just do with data. So this is the topic of unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning we just have the data without some specific labels as shown here in this example. So you will see that we don't have colored points anymore but have some distribution of the data. And in unsupervised learning the goal is to learn some representation of the data that can help us to extract some information or gain some insights about the data. That will maybe help us later to decide what to label and how to label it maybe or to just uh, extract some useful information from it, like a generative model in the end. But um, here we are particularly looking at some specific tasks that we want to solve via unsupervised learning. So, and uh, I will cover here three different topics in unsupervised learning and we will start with the so-called density estimation. So given such a data set like this, we want to do in density estimation something to, to model the data. So here we are aiming at deriving a probabilistic model, for instance here, like this P of X, such that we can uh, model the data. So something like a, a parametric model in the end that gives us um, a model of the data. And using this density estimation model, we can then maybe generate new training, new examples or generate new points in the data set. And here I showed a very simple model of this data, uh, in particular uh, just a normal distribution of the data. So we fitted a normal distribution with the maximum likelihood estimate. So we covered this in the part where we covered um, the naive base model in the I think it was the second lecture. Um, and when you do this, you get something like this. So I always show the normal distributions now with the mean via this point. So that's the mean of the normal distribution and the uh, standard one standard deviation covariance by this ellipse. So that means here in this case, uh, we can see that this is maybe not a not so good model because we cannot um, um, model here the multiple yeah, regions of the data very well. So, and this is now the first topic that you want to cover. So, and instead of using maybe one single um, normal distribution to model the data, one could say that, yeah, maybe a good idea is maybe to use multiple uh, Gaussians in this case. Um, we see here this data and we want to represent it in the end by uh, multiple normal distributions uh, shown here and the color indicates here not the label but the yeah to which normal distribution this point mainly corresponds. So you will see here this, this yellow points mainly correspond to this normal distribution for this yellow dot here so with the mean and with this covariance and the Blue, blue points correspond to this blue normal distribution and the uh, red points to the red blue uh, normal distribution. But what you also can see here is that we are not making here a clear decision between the points. So as you can see here, these points are varying between red and blue. So we have somehow a soft assignment here. And, um, and the idea is that each of the um, Gaussians in the end model some part of the data. So, and uh, we will denote always the k Gaussians by this normal distribution here and we denote the k's mean by mu k, uh, k and the uh, covariance by sigma k. So we can, yeah, as, as said, uh, we can apply this to uh, unsupervised in a way to our unsupervised data. But um, to 
yeah, model this now, we have to introduce something into this model. So we cannot just use a P of X here, but we have to introduce something. And this something is called a latent variable. So we can do, uh, just by using the marginalization property, we can just write the P of X as the sum over uh, joint probability, um, which has now here this H in, inside there and the X. So now we have multiple um, components here. Uh, multiple joint distributions and and uh, yeah we will sum them up to get in the end the uh, p of x in the end and this h is called a latent variable or hidden variable so to say so because um, yeah we we use it in a way inside the model but it's not something that we can directly fit from the data or something like this so it's a difference to the uh, usual um, optimization that we have in the end. So and when we have then the uh, disjoint uh, distribution, we can just write it uh, as this conditionals here. And here we decide to split it something like this so that we have a probabilistic model about the uh, hidden variable, which is then um, a categorical distribution. And we have the P of X given H. So that means um, we weight basically the conditionals uh, by this P of H here. So and for the so-called Gaussian mixture model, which I tried to explain in the beginning, is that we have now multiple um, Gaussians. So therefore we have here, this can be seen as a mixture of this Gaussian. So therefore it's called Gaussian mixture model. And here we assume that the P of H, uh, so this uh, latent variable model, is basically a categorical distribution. So important to note is here that, um, that the lambda case have to add up to one in the end. So to make this a valid probability distribution. And of course, the lambda case are always positive. Um, and the um, conditional distribution over the data given the hidden variable is then our normal distributions. As I said, so the case normal distribution has the uh, mean mu k and the covariance sigma k. And this is the assumption that we make in the beginning. So this is the modeling assumption that we do. And as always, when we want to optimize something like this, we are looking for the likelihood. And when we want to have the maximum likelihood estimate, we then uh, can derive it like this. So we want to find the parameters theta star, and we want to uh, do this maximum over all parameters. And uh, then we have the product over all samples because we are assuming IID data. So uh, it's identically and uh, independently distributed. And then we have here the joint distribution. And when we write it out, then we can put here the log uh, logarithm in front of it. So the usual trick. So we are using a likelihood and here the logarithm. Important to note is that we are still staying here with the maximization and not doing a minimization because we are not using the negative log likelihood. So um, this is a difference to the parts that we had before always. And uh, when we write it out, then we can pull the logarithm in, so the product uh, gets to a, a sum. And then we can um, have here the logarithm in front of the sum. So one thing to note here is that now, because of the logarithm in front of the sum, we cannot pull it basically in. So we cannot make the parameters of the h and the x be basically independent from each other. So therefore, uh, the gradient would be a, a little bit more complicated. So to get the parameters of the p, uh, p of h and then the p of, h, p of x given h, um, it's now a little bit more tricky. But uh, a cool thing that we can now do is that we are not directly optimizing this part here but we are optimizing uh, a lower bound, so to say. And here is a, a method uh, used, which is called expectation maximization, which is essentially this, this idea. So we have here our likelihood function, or log likelihood function, doesn't matter so much, uh, over some parameters. And instead of trying to find the parameters for this function, which might be very complicated in the end, or maybe complicated to derive a gradient from, we are just using a lower bound here. And this lower bound has only the property that it's always below um, the likelihood function. And the, the property that we want to have in the end is that the lower bound is maybe easier to derive so that we can derive a gradient from this. And the lower bound is always um, below the likelihood function. And what expectation maximization now does is it alternates between 
finding a new lower bound here at this parameter theta, and then um, maximizing this lower bound. As you can see here, we are moving then on the lower bound up until we maximize the lower bound. Then with this, we get our new parameter theta, and then we are fitting a new um, lower bound or finding a new lower bound that is uh, tightly fitting to the likelihood. But as you can see here, the um, lower bound has not the property necessarily, um, not always, that it uh, um, is reaching the maximum at the exact same position as the likelihood function. So, and then we do this iteratively, so we are maximizing the lower bound again. For this parameter, we find a new lower bound, and as you can see, the shape of the lower bounds can also vary in between. So that's also something that's not always the same shape, basically, but it just has to fit tightly under the uh, likelihood function here. And then when we do this, we hopefully get in the end to the maximum of the likelihood function. So, and this is somehow the idea that we want to do now. So deriving a lower bound and then uh, with this lower bound to maximize it and then do this uh, um, um, in an iterative manner so that first we are getting a new lower bound and then we are maximizing lower bound, so to say. And the first question is, so how do we find this lower bound? And uh, for finding the lower bound, we can uh, now introduce some um, variables here, this qi, um, that are dependent on the h. And these are just uh, distributions. So that means they are summing up to 1. And every, every entry, so for a specific h, is then uh, greater than 0. So that this is a, a probability distribution in the end. So for now, it doesn't matter so much what uh, Q is in the end. We will fi figure this out. But uh, for the derivation, it's, uh, we are just keeping this like this. And um, we can add this Q by this, yeah, dividing Q by Q is just one. So we can just add it. it there's no problem with this. So, and, but when we um, introduce this, we can rearrange this a little bit so that the one Q is standing in front of it. And then we have this term here, which is the fraction of the um, joint probability divided by the Q. And one trick that we can now use, which is already mentioned here, is basically that we can use the Jensen's inequality. And the uh, inequality tells us that we can now move the log inside and um, um, have then the lower bound property. So that, that is now our lower bound because it's always um, the likelihood um, is always, or here in this case, the log likelihood is always larger or equal to this lower bound. And here, as I said, we are using the Jensen's inequality. And um, the Jensen's inequality is like whatever. We have a function that is convex. So in this case, the function is convex over a sum um, of a distribution times um, yeah, x. And then uh, this is always uh, smaller e equal to the sum over the distribution times the function of x. So the, the thing that happens here is we move the f, x, uh, the, the f inside, and then we are getting this. And this is guaranteed to always be the case. In this case, because the logarithm is a concave function, we have to flip basically the uh, inequality here. So that means we can now. Um, um, yeah, do the thing as here. We are moving the logarithm in so that it now stands here. And the good thing is now with this, uh, when we have the logarithm inside here, we can do something in the end. So, but the question that arises naturally, of course, is what is Q in the end? Um, for uh, finding the Q function, we are just now uh, focusing on one term of this whole uh, sum over all examples. So this thing that we are now deriving for this one example is, of course, also true for the, all the other examples. Um, when we have this, this uh, term of the lower bound, we can just um, yeah, now write the joint probability some, uh, uh, as follows, so that the h is now uh, um, dependent on the x. So we have the conditional over h given x and the p of x here. And when we now um, do the logar take the logarithm um, uh, from this, then we can write uh, or yeah, we we just um, because this is the product over this both terms, so we can then just uh, 
um, move this over here. So the logarithm is a product of this ball, so then we can have this something like this here. So, and uh, the good thing about this is, um, because this is not depending basically on um, the, 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 so this, this, this is, uh, this is independent of the, uh, 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 this is basically the entropy here, um, which will not be um, so important because we, we have the, all the terms that we need here. And the good thing about this is that this term here is basically the uh, kalbeck leibler divergence. And the kalbeck leibler divergence tells us, um, so it's basically the negative kalbeck leibler uh, uh, divergence, so also short KL divergence now called, um, which tells us how similar the probability distributions P and Q are. So um, this is basically a distance measure between um, P and Q. So, and uh, yeah, the good thing about distance measures is that uh, when their P and Q is equal, this will be zero. So and when we put this in here, then we will see that when we set Q exactly to this term, then this kalbeck leibler divergence gets zero. And therefore, to find a tight bound that is uh, below uh, the, um, the, log, uh, the log likelihood, we just have to set the um, Q to P of H um, given X. And this is the thing that we are doing here. So to get a tight bound, we use just the equality that we set the Q to P of H um, equals K given X I. So that means we have now found our equation for our Q. And um, now this term um, is nothing very special. We, we basically just flipped uh, the position of the H and we can also undo this in the end. In the end. So to find P of H given X, we can then use the, um, um, the conditional probability, something like this here, so that it's again the joint probability. And then for this we can then just um, write the P of X, Xi as the sum. Um, we are just doing the, the trick that we did in the beginning, so we're putting the related variable in again. Then we have our um, joint distributions here, and then we can just use the terms that we want to have for the Gaussian mixture model. And this was that we have the model over our latent variable um, times the P of X given H, and we can the same, uh, we do the same in the denominator. So in, but this is the thing that we want to have in the end, because now we have our um, model over P of uh, H and our uh, normal distributions here, and then we can derive basically everything that we want in the end. And um, to, as I said, for the expectation maximization of the algorithms, we are now optimizing the parameters um, in an iterative way. And in the first step we are using, we update the lower bound. And for this we just have to calculate these distributions here. And this for each example xi. And this we will now call um, uh, the yeah, responsibilities rki. Um, so to just make the notation a little bit shorter. And we are doing the update basically with the old parameters. So it means we over time we are adjusting our parameters and we are just taking the old parameters here. And in the M step we maximize the lower bound with the responsibilities that we found in the E step and then find, update the new parameters. And the responsibilities determine um, the influence of the xi on the parameter updates, basically. And this is basically the algorithm that we are now using. And to derive the m step for the Gaussian mixture model, we now have to do some derivations again. So we want to find the parameters at time step t, which are depending on the uh, last parameters here and the q, qi's. So as we said before, the qi's are just the last responsi uh, responsibilities at the last time step. And then we can rewrite the joint probability again like this. And um, as you can see via the logarithm, we get the minus here and um, the, this term is just a constant, so we can just drop it. And then to find the, the parameters, we can then um, just pull, put in the, um, the, the uh, uh, functional models of the latent variable model and of the conditionals here. And this was again like the um, the 
the categorical distribution and the normal distributions here. And um, for the Gaussians, we already did the derivation uh, in the near eighth base. So as you remember, for the Gaussians, the mean turns out to be just the mean over all the data. And um, the, the covariance is basically the covariance of the data. So this is our maximum likelihood estimate of the um, normal distribution here. And here we only have to account basically for the weightings in the end. So that means the mean is basically a weighted mean over all the responsibilities over all the data. And the covariance is also taking into account the responsibilities. So this is all what, what happens here in the end. And for the mixture weights, so for this uh, lambda case, we are now having, uh, we can just derive this also. Um, using the concept of Lagrange multiplier. So as you remember, so the lambda case have to sum up to one. And then we always have these constraints that are something is the sum of something and equals to something. We can then just introduce these constraints by a Lagrange multiplier. Um, when we do this, we then uh, do the determine the gradient in respect to the uh, lambda j and the uh, rho. And then we are setting this to zero. And then we, when we do the update, and I also show this in the lecture notes, basically, um, you can derive then this update formula. And it's, um, so the, the entry of the j uh, categorical at the time point t is basically just the sum over our responsibilities divided by the number of all, yeah, the number of all, uh, the, the count of all examples in the end. So, and this is just the, the simple thing. So, and now to um, yeah, do the expectation maximization for the Gaussian mixture model, we can then have this following algorithm. Um, we are just initializing basically at the first point in time the um, mu's, uh, the sigmas, and the lambda k's as follows. So, the mu's are just some points that we randomly select from all the points. So, this is our starting setting for the uh, means of the normal distributions. The sigmas are just initialized by the identity, and the lambda case are just in the beginning just uh, a uniform distribution here. So that means it's uh, one divided by k. And then um, in the first step, we determine the responsibilities at the last point in time. So that means we have to calculate uh, p of h given x. And um, when you just plug in all the um, yeah, derivations that we had before, we are getting these terms here. Um, and then when we do the update uh, of the parameters, we are just using the responsibilities that we calculated in the E step. And then we update all the parameters of the uh, mixture weights and the mean and the uh, covariance in the end. And this is all that we have to do to fit the maximum likelihood estimate for the Gaussian mixture model in the end. <coughs> and um, yeah, of course, we are not doing this only one time, but we are doing this multiple times um, because we are, as you saw in the beginning, we are uh, finding a new lower bound, maximizing this, and then we're getting closer and closer to the maximum of the log likelihood in the end. And uh, when we apply this to our data, so let's see, we have the um, always here on the left the, the state at the last iteration. And in the beginning, I said uh, that uh, in the beginning, we just randomly take some points as the means. So in this case, we choose here these three points. And we initialize the covariances to uh, the identity metric. So that means here we have circular shapes of the covariances, or the ellipses, basically. And then uh, what we first do is take uh, based on this, so the mean and the, uh, standard, uh, the, the covariances and the lambdas that are equal in the beginning. We are just determining in the E step the responsibilities. So in this case, uh, it looks something like this. So they are always colored according to, um, to which, um, yeah, the, 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 the color distribution just shows how the probability over P of H given X is. So that means you will get here, um, because here the probability for the um, yellow Gaussian is the highest, so P of H uh, equals one maybe. Um, given x is the highest, so this will get the yellow color for the second one, 
Um, the blue one, they get the blue colors, and for the red ones, they get the red colors. And you also see that there are some uh, mixture between the weights. So we have not hard assignments in the end, but we have here soft assignments between the points. And based on these responsibilities, we are now updating our parameters, and then it looks something like this. So as you can see, the, the yellow um, normal distribution is basically updated a lot in the first step. So we are just moving the mean like uh, here in between which can also be yeah, guessed from the distribution of the points that the mean should be something, somewhere here. And the standard, uh, the uh, covariance is also updated in, in a way so that it now captures this both of the data. But also the blue and the red ones are updated. So the red one is maybe not updated so much, so the covariance only changes a little bit. And also the mean and the blue one moves a little bit uh, in the other direction. And then we can do this again. So this is again the last state. With this, we are updating our responsibilities. You will see you, when you remember it, um, or maybe I can show it. Um, here in the beginning, we had uh, uh, yeah, very yellowish points here because now the, uh, the, the responsibilities changed a little bit so that we have here a little bit more blue in the end and here a little bit more, more reddish point. And then we are updating this again in the M step. And um, here the change is not that large, um, but um, when we see here, this is then the, the full um, animation over all iterations. So I used here 50 iterations, and in the beginning you see that it's basically in this state, and then it slowly converges to the state where nothing changes again. And this is then the state where you basically stop um, with, the go with the update of the parameters. So. Um, as you can see here, in the end, it's just uh, slightly changing the means and the covariances of this. This is basically fixed after a couple of iterations, and then it stays like this. And this is then uh, what we get out from the uh, Gaussian mixture model in the end. And this is then modeling our data in some way. So of course, it uh, has the assumption that we can model our data, basically with, uh, here in this case, K uh, Gaussians. So k is basically a hyperparameter that we have to choose. And um, yeah, in this case, it works out quite nicely. So that you can see, we have uh, three Gaussians that are capturing uh, basically the distribution of the data here. And um, yeah, this is then the end result. And yeah, as you might have guessed from this, so we cannot only use it for modeling p of x, so the distribution over all the data but we can also use it for something that is called clustering. In clustering, we are interested in finding groups in the data um, where points belong to. So, and these clusters or uh, groups, which I call here, um, have the property that they are inside the cluster uh, share some similarity. In this case, maybe the distance to the, uh, to the center of the uh, cluster. So the means are called then cluster centers. And um, yeah, but can also be something different. So, um, and the means are now here the cluster centers in this case. So this is then also a way of analyzing your data. So how many clusters you can find or where are the clusters and can you maybe then derive, when you have then maybe found the clusters, can you maybe then find by just looking, maybe these are images or something like this, what these clusters maybe correspond to. And, um, the re responsibilities are then here soft assignments for the clusters. And um, another famous algorithm for doing clustering is, of course, the k-means clustering. And the, the relation between the Gaussian mixture model and k-means in the end is that k-means is just a special case of the uh, Gaussian mixture models in the end. Um, in the k-means algorithm, we are just doing hard assignments. So the responsibilities will not be between 0 and 1. They just will be 1 or 0. And we just take the um, arc max over p of h given x in the end. Um, for the k-means algorithm, usually one doesn't think about these responsibilities as uh, distributions in the end. But we are just uh, taking responsibilities by closeness to the uh, cluster centers. And the k-means algorithm is then as simple as this here. So we, as again, we initialize the means or the cluster centers um, randomly by choosing points from the, our data. 
Then we assign each point to the nearest cluster center. This corresponds to the taking the maximum over p of h given x. And then um, with this assignment, we are then just updating the cluster centers by um, summing over um, all points with the responsibilities. So that uh, uh, takes into account that we only take the points that are assigned to basically one cluster center. And then we're updating the means and we're re repeating this until convergence again. And here's one critical part, but this is also a critical part for the Gaussian mixture model, is that the initial cluster centers um, or the initial means um, decide basically uh, how the clustering will look in the end. So if you have a maybe not so good choice of the means or the cluster centers in the beginning, then you will get maybe a worse result at the end. And um, but in generally in the k-means clustering algorithm, the, the choice is basically a little bit more important than with the Gaussian mixture models because we have here the hard assignments. So with the soft assignments, it might be that it can get out of the local uh, maximum in the end. And um, this is basically uh, the, the part on the density estimation or the clustering here. And uh, one other thing that we want to do with the data is maybe to extract some lower dimensional representation of the data that enables us to get some insight about the data. And this corresponds to the concept of dimensionality reduction. In dimensionality the, the reduction, we have some higher dimensional data. So here in this case, a two dimensional data set, and we want to project it on, um, on some lower dimensional representation that uh, retains as much information as possible in the end. And um, so the goal is to find a low dimensional representation of the data um, that retains the information as much as possible. And when we think of it, it corresponds to something that is called a projection. So, and we are looking now here for a projection matrix um, B uh, of the dimension. So it has D rows and M um, columns. And uh, it projects a point uh, from our d-dimensional space to a uh, lower dimensional space m, such that the z is in the end the b transpose times x. And uh, this is uh, what we aim at. And we will now derive a specific method to do this. And uh, in this case, we are assuming that the b is orthonormal. So that means that the columns uh, fulfill the following properties. So for an autonormal matrix, as you maybe remember from your linear algebra class, means that the, um, the columns, each column to, each, uh, to the other columns is basically um, orthogonal, and the orthogonality is uh, expressed by the um, scalar product of bi uh, times bj, and this uh, must equal to zero. And when, the, when we talk about one column, it uh, should be normalized in the end. So therefore, it's the orthogonal and the normalization property here. So we have an orthogonal, also normal um, matrix in the end. And this is our projection matrix. And for deriving the method, how to find this, we are just now looking at um, uh, the first dimension and the rest comes from this derivation in the end. So what we want to have in the end is a projection. So in this case here, uh, for one dimension, that uh, retains the variance in the end. So we want to have that when we project uh, our data on this dimension, that the um, variance in this dimension is maximized. So in this example, we have here this uh, green projection, which produces basically this distribution of the points, which is shown here. So that means here we have the variance of the data, something like this. Then we have the red um, projection that uh, corresponds to this span. Then we have this variance in the end. So as you can see, this is the, the, uh, the maximum variance in this case. And then we would maybe choose maybe this, um, this projection direction, then we see that all the points are just projected basically on this small um, area here. So here, um, when we look at these three examples, basically we would like to have this uh, reddish line in the end, or the, the as first projection basically something that produces something like this. And um, the goal is here that the encoded vectors, so the z's that are in the lower dimensional space, should maximize the variance in each dimension. 
And uh, for finding the maximum variance direction of the projection, we now assume that we have a zero center, a centered data. So that means that when we um, sum up over all the x's, then the mean vector is just zero. But this is a restriction that we can make here um, because we can yeah, always um, uh, zero center our data before we do the algorithm in the end. So, but this makes uh, the derivation a little bit easier. And now we are looking just on the projection of the first dimension and therefore we are just looking at the first column, B1, uh, and we, uh, for the projection we just have the scalar product here. So B1 uh, transpose time x and this will give us the first component of the encoding vector, so the z. <coughs> and um, as I said, our goal is to find uh, the projection, so the B1, that now in this uh, dimension leads to that ones that has the um, largest variance. And for uh, yeah, putting this into mathematical terms, what we want to achieve is that the variance in this first dimension, which is expressed like this, because we have now zero centered data, um, we can just uh, express it like this, so set one uh, squared, and then we just plug in the definition of our set one i, uh, set one i uh, here from this here, then we get this term here. So, and when we are now going forward, um, we can just rearrange the terms to derive an objective that we can op uh, optimize in the end. So that means that we have here our term from before, we then just can um, uh, yeah, do the square, and uh, when we do the square, we have this, this relation here, that it's like B1 transpose times Xi times Xi transpose times Bi, so this is the same, and um, then we can um, basically pull the um, summation in, because the B1s don't depend on the I, so we are just putting it outside, and then we have this, this expression inside here. And when you look at this, then you will uh, yeah, remember, because we have zero centered data here, this is just the data covariance in the end. So and we call this now S in the following. And when we put everything together, we want to maximize basically V1, um, which is then given by B1 transpose times S times B1. Um, but have to keep in mind that we have the constraint that the B1s should be um, normalized. So that means we want to optimize the B1 such that um, the B1 is basically normalized in the end. And this is, can be expressed like this. And um, again, we had this before, when we have such relation here, then we can just use the uh, Lagrange multiplier. In the end, we have here our, uh, our objective L, which is just given by this thing that we want to maximize, and we have to add this Lagrange multiplier here. And um, as always with Lagrange multipliers, we are deriving basically the uh, gradient in respect to B1, and the gradient in respect to the Lagrange multiplier, which is then the par partial, uh, uh, no, the partial derivative in this case, um, to B1 and to L, uh, lambda 1, and this is then just this, uh, this things here. So we have here a quadratic term, so we have the 2 in front of it, and um, from this we have also just the, um, the 2 that remains with the lambda in there, inside there, and then we have for the Lagrange multiplier this uh, partial derivative. And when we now set each of this expression to 0 and solve it, then we get um, the following relations. So we can just uh, pu um, put the lambda 1 b1 on the, uh, on the other side where 0 was standing and uh, for the b1 transpose times b, we can just put the 1 on the other side. So, and when you now look at this expression here, this is a matrix times a vector should equal to a scalar times a vector. And uh, when you now uh, look at your linear algebra knowledge again, then you will see that this is of course an eigenvalue problem. So we have the B1 is an eigenvector um, to the matrix of uh, um, S, and uh, the B1, uh, the, the lambda 1 is the eigenvalue, the corresponding one. 
and um, to find now the maximum of this, then of course we have to take the maximum uh, eigenvalue. So the eigenvector to the maximal eigenvalue. So and the basis vector is then the eigenvector of the largest, uh, largest eigenvalue. And, um, and this is usually called the principal component. And um, for finding the remaining basis vectors, so the B1 to uh, the B2 to Bms, we can now use a similar derivation. And it turns out that these are then just corresponding to the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix again. And um, with all this derivation, we now, I hopefully convinced you that uh, finding the projection is just finding the m eigenvectors of the largest uh, eigenvalues. And um, the, the one, one thing that you also can see from the der der derivation in the end is that the, the variance that is captured by the m principal components is now just the um, sum over the um, lambdas in the end, so the eigenvalues. And this leads us to the algorithm that is very famous and very often used in uh, machine learning, the so-called principal components analysis. And as I said, um, the, the first thing that we can do is to standardize our data. And this is something that uh, is also done usually to normalize the data. Um, as I, I also explained it in the, in, the, um, in the tutorials when we talked about the regression models so that we just subtract the mean and divide each dimension by its variance. And um, then uh, when we have the standardized data, so it's zero centered and so on, then we can just use the same um, insight that we got from before. We are determining the B as the um, matrix that contains the eigenvectors to the M largest eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues um, as columns. And this is then our projection matrix. And we can then get the projected points back by just applying our projection to the lower dimensional space and then um, just doing the back projection basically in our original space. And this is our then the, the axis. And the, the x star is now basically the standardized value. So we are subtracting in each dimension the mean of the data and subtracting it by this uh, sigma d. And um, for reconstructing then in the original space, because this is now the zero centered space, basically we then have to do the, um, the yeah, destandardization basically. So we have to, after we have found this uh, X uh, tilde star, we then have to basically um, multiply this again by the, uh, the, um, um, the variance uh, and then uh, um, at the mean in the end. And then we get the reconstruction. And when we have the reconstruction of the point, then we can look of, at uh, yeah, what is basically captured in the principal components. And um, here's some example for this. So this is, these are just numbers from the so-called MNIST data set. So there are 28 by 28 um, um, times pictures. Um, that are capture that are just uh, zero and one, so corresponding to two numbers. So this is the original numbers, and then when we look at the reconstruction of these numbers, just using the first uh, principal component, then we can see that it somehow the first principal component captures, yeah, the the, the eightness somehow. So they, they are still looking like eights, but they are not um, yeah tilted in a way. So that means that we, uh, with the first principal component, we are just capturing that there's something like an eight. So, and when we are adding more principal components, so this is using 10 principal con components, then we can see that the, the blurry image that we had from the eights is now um, moving in some directions. So this is basically then capturing uh, the orientation somehow. And as you can see, then, and when we add more and more principal components, we are retaining more and more information of the data. So in, in the end, here the 500 uh, principal components are basically enough to, to somehow get a good reconstruction in the end of the original data. And this is uh, lower than the uh, 28 by 28 um, pixels that we had in the beginning. And this lower dimensional representation is maybe then something that we also want to use for our learning algorithms because it's always easier to with, uh, 
work with lower dimensional um, vectors in the end. And um, yeah, so the principal component analysis enables us to basically learn from our data some lower dimensional representation, which we then can use to uh, train our models in the end. And um, yeah, by doing this, we are just also maybe removing information that is maybe not needed in the end and then makes the learning task easier in the end. And we can also use this for um, visualization in the end. So we can just uh, take the, the first two principal components and then um, also visualize this in the end. But usually the principal components analysis will not yeah, um, give you a very good representation of uh, the data in the end because it cannot capture all the structural um, yeah, things that happens in the data uh, by projecting this to these two dimensional, uh, to the two principal components in the end. And therefore, um, I want now to take a look at a more sophisticated method to do this. So in this case, we want to visualize a high dimensional data. Here, as I said, the, um, the MNIST data, for instance. And by using this method, we can then uh, derive something like this. And as you can see, so the, the colors are now um, basically just, um, yeah, um, because we know to which number it corresponds, the algorithm just looks at the high dimensional vectors and then represents it in a way that it, um, closed vectors are cl still close together. And by using this method, you will then find out that you have then this cluster. So of the zeros, here these are the ones, uh, the threes, and so on and so on. So, and this is a very nice representation of the data because it can tell you much more about the structure as maybe it can be captured by just the first two principal components. And, um, and the idea is that we want to have in our lower dimensional embedding, so this time, this case, a two dimensional embedding, we want to somehow um, retain the distances between the uh, high dimensional points in the end. So that means in our two dimensional re representation that we have in the end, we want to keep points that are um, close together in the higher dimensional space, also close together in the embedding space. So we want to have a distance preserving um, embedding. So here, because I'm restricted to the two dimensional plane, I'm just drawing it like this so that I have here our data space, which is um, a d-dimensional space. So imagine it's very complicated, but the thing that we have here in this d-dimensional space is that these three points here are maybe close together and this is our also close together. And what we want to achieve in the end when we use this method is to find an embedding that still keeps the points that are close to together in the high dimensional space also close together in the two dimensional space. And um, so we have two uh, d-dimensional vectors and we want to find vectors uh, yi that are two-dimensional, that preserve somehow the structural um, um, correspondences of the high-dimensional data. And one method to do this is basically the stochastic neighbor embedding, or SNE. Um, the SNE now works as follows. So it first converts the Euclidean distances in the original space into conditional probabilities. And these are usually called the affinities. So we have here then the um, just Gaussians. And because we are dividing basically this Gaussian by the other Gaussians, the normalization constants cancel out. And we have for each of the Gaussians um, a sigma i. And um, in the upper term, we have, um, therefore, it's a conditional. So the i is always fixed, and the j is some other point. And um, we are just dividing it, basically, by the, um, yeah, the probabilities for um, taking the, the other points here. So um, it, it's very similar to the uh, softmax um, in the end, um, and um, what one thing that we assume here is that for the um, same point, so when um, xj is basically um, also i, we are just setting this to zero because we are not interested in this and we just want to um, yeah, think about this. And for the lower dimensional embedding, we are doing the same. So, but here we are not 
um, taking care about the sigmas. So the sigma i's are specifically chosen here. Uh, chosen here. Uh, I will come to this in a bit. And um, uh, in the lower dimensional embedding, we want to have a similar um, structure in the end. So the embedding vectors, the uh, yi's and yj's, should also now be close together if these points are close together. So and to basically because now we have two probability distributions um, over the, the points, we can now use the concept from before where we measured basically the difference between probability distribution. And here it comes the Kalbeck uh, uh, Leiber di divergence again. And um, that means to find the uh, yi's in the end, we can just use the um, KL divergence again, which measures the difference between the uh, conditional distribution in the high dimensional space and the conditional distribution in the lower dimensional space. And we can do this because the distributions are just between 0 and 1. When we would use the original points, basically, um, we would have to think about Euclidean distances. So the, the cool thing about here, the stochastic neighbor embedding, is basically it, it reasons about probabilities and not anymore about distances or metrics or something like this. So and, um, when we do this, we can then derive, in the end, um, good embedding vectors that retain basically the, the shape of the um, probability distributions here. And uh, one thing to note is we had the sigma i's, and for the sigma i's we have to sp specifically choose values in the end. And uh, one way to do this is that we want to have smaller sigma i's, so more peaked normal distributions in the end, um, for denser regions, because there we yeah, we have many points that are basically near it. And in sparser regions, uh, we want to have it larger. So, and therefore, we have to basically choose the sigma i's depending on what happens in the data. And for doing this, we are now using in the um, TSNE or in the uh, SNE also, the sigma i's are determined via just binary search. So, the optimization is basically we are trying out different values of the sigma i's and we want to reach a certain perplexity. And the perplexity that we are assuming here, so that we are choosing, this is the hyperparameter, is then uh, given by p. And we want to um, have the perplexity over pi basically uh, reaching this, uh, this, um, um, perplex uh, this perplexity value that we choose, so the pi. And um, the perplexity is then defined as 2 to the power of minus um, sigma j, pj, logarithm of two to the power uh, to two to the basis two from pji, and as you might remember from the decision tree discussion, um, this is of course then only the entropy. So, and as I said, um, we are just selecting si's and then doing a, basically a binary search to find the si that resolves uh, results in the desired perplexity. And this is then depending on the um, <coughs> this is then depending on the yeah, neighborhood of the points. So and you can think of the perplexity as somehow deciding how many neighbors you account for. And um, when we are now moving from the uh, stochastic neighbor embedding to the T stochastic neighbor embedding, so T S N E, um, we can prove basically the, the receipt in, in the following way. So as, uh, as I said, so for the um, affinities in higher dimensional space, we are just now computing symmetric uh, affinities. So it doesn't matter which one we choose before. So we are just using here uh, a simple um, sum over the affinity from i given j to j given i. So it's just the sum of both and we divide it by 2 over uh, 2 uh, by the number of examples in the end. And to get better results in the embedding in the end, so um, to get better visualizations in the end, it's now better to not use um, the Gaussians, um, but using a T distribution. And for the T distribution, uh, I just plotted this here. So the Gaussian is um, the uh, yellow one that you see here, it's uh, quickly reaching zero after. Uh, um, yeah. Um, certain standard deviations. 
So, and the, the good thing about the t distribution, and here in this case we are taking the t distribution with a degree of freedom one, um, you can see that it's a more heavier tail. So, that means it's not getting directly to zero, but it counts for more in the neighborhood. And this is a good, uh, a good thing in the end because it leads to better visualizations in the end. And um, as before in the TSNE uh, uh, embedding uh, visualization method, it's uh, just yeah, minimizing the KL divergence again. And um, we, when we have the KL divergence defined as this, then in the paper from uh, van der Maarten it's shown that the gradient corresponds then to this nice uh, formula here in the end. So nothing very complicated in the end. Um, and the, the algorithm now works as follows. So we have the hyperparameters of the perplexity that we are choosing. So something between 5 to 50 I think is said in the paper is a good value. So which has to be adjusted in the end and the number of iterations. So um, it should be high enough because it takes some time to, um, to do the iteration. Then we have some learning rate and then we have the momentum. And the uh, algorithm now works as follows, that it first uh, determines the pairwise uh, affinities and um, with the desired perplexity. So that means we have to do this binary search to find um, the, the uh, perfect values there. And then um, um, we sample the uh, uh, initial solution, in this case the yi's are sampled and um, then we are doing just um, iteratively, as the number of iterations that we want. Um, we compute the lower dimensional affinities and using this we can then compute the gradients. And with the gradients we can then update our embedding vectors. So it's just the embedding vector of time t is the last embedding vector that we had. <coughs> then we're adding the gradient and then comes this term here. This is a, the momentum term that mm, stabilizes uh, the, the optimization a, a bit. But this we will also cover basically later in the um, neural network lectures again. So, but um, yeah, this is basically the algorithm. And with this algorithm you get then the uh, nice visualizations in the end. But um, yeah, you now have three methods basically for doing unsupervised learning. So. These are uh, yeah, yeah, the, the workhorses of uh, um, unsupervised learning. So we had the Gaussian mixture models, which uh, is a method for the des uh, density estimation. Um, we had the dimensionality reduction, which is the PCA, so the principal components analysis, um, which leads to lower dimensional representations that are still keeping some properties of the original data. And then we had the visualization, which is then the TSNE um, visualization method, which then leads to these plots. So it's uh, yeah, a good method to show basically the structure of the higher dimensional data. Um, but uh, for um, more, in the, yeah, more information on the TSNE, you can look at this paper from uh, Van der Martin and Hinton. Um, which is describing these methods and uh, a very good, um, um, yeah, also visual uh, um, yeah, guide how to use the TSNE eff eff effectively um, is uh, given in this uh, distill um, article. So, um, and here you will also find some examples where you can play around with the perplexity but also of the number of uh, points and then you will see what happens with different parameters. And this specific uh, article is also shedding some light that you maybe can also maybe sometimes, yeah, because this lower dimensional representation is not always, yeah, something that is really corresponding to the high dimensional structure in the end depending on the parameters so that it maybe leads to some patterns that are maybe not present in the original data anyway. So, but this is something that you always have to keep in mind with this, all these visualization methods. So, even if you get something out from this that looks very nice, it might not something, 
that is yeah, really happening in a higher dimensional space. But this is the nature of the, the, the thing. You have a very high dimensional data set and then you are doing some lower dimensional embedding. And the, the method can only do as good as it can. So, and with this, um, I'm also coming to an end and uh, we are now um, seeing us next week. Thank you for your attention.